Hello everyone, this is Daniel. Uh, I work at NXP and together with Juliana, uh, we will talk about the Sound Open firmware um, effort to integrate with Zephyr. So um, basically we will introduce Sound Open firmware, uh, a short overview of uh, what it does and why is it useful. Then we will try to see where sound open firmware could fit inside the Zephyr. And then the changes we've done for uh, uh, NXP iDotemix 8 platforms, uh, together with the challenges and bugs and all the things that we encounter during this work. And finally, uh, we'll tell you about our uh, future plans. So sound open firmware is an audio DSP firmware and SDK that provides an infrastructure and tools to the developers to create uh, audio applications. Uh, usually uh, NXP i.mx8 platforms have uh, one or multiple ARM cores that we will call application processor and uh, zero or one uh, DSP cores. The DSP core will run a software that we that we will call it firmware from now on. And the application processor typically runs Linux and it helps the DSP to load the firmware and create the audio scenarios. Uh, sound open firmware source code um, is compiled using a proprietary toolchain or a GCC toolchain. First, I think I forgot to tell you that the DSP that we use at the NXP is the Cadence Hi-5-4 uh, DSP. So basically using this toolchain, we can create a firmware image <coughs> and the firmware image is loaded by the uh, Linux driver, Linux SOF driver to a, sh a shared memory area and then the <clears throat> Linux driver just resets the DSP which will start to run. Together with the firmware, <clears throat> the audio scenario is created um, inside a topology file. Uh, this file describes the components and the buffers and the links between them. Uh, the host OS parses this topology file and creates the, uh, DS, uh, the topology on the firmware by sending uh, custom commands to the DSP. Uh, also, this project comes with a lot of tools, like for example, a, uh, an emulator, a debugger, um, also logger tool, so that we, are, uh, we can see what's happening on the DSP side. Uh, and also runtime tools that are very uh, requested by our customers. Uh, for example, uh, tools that can tune uh, some parameters uh, existing on DSP components. Um, this is the uh, architecture of the sound open firmware. On the right, right hand side, we can see that uh, sound open firmware um, uh, uses a small uh, real-time environment that is provided by Extensa uh, in, in, the, in the form of a microkernel. And we, we are using parts from Extensa OS and Extensa HAL that will provide us with the uh, basic primitive in order to boot and uh, be able to run tasks on the DSP. Uh, this part works very well for now on, but for our plans on expanding and scaling uh, the firmware, uh, we, we, we find some limitation in, in what uh, Extensa provides for now. Um, the, other, the other parts are not really important for this presentation. The audio component parts are uh, some open coded C uh, files which implement various components and then also have the platform drivers, uh, also uh, open coded uh, C drivers in an infrastructure created by the sound open firmware. These are not really important for our first steps right now. We will, we will look at um, alternatives to Extensa OS in order, for example, to allow us to run the, the firmware on other uh, DSPs or on other uh, cores other than, than Extensa. And 
uh, looking on the World Wide Web, we found Zephyr. Uh, this is an open source project with a great community. We find that uh, on the Slack channel, there are more than uh, 2,000 people, and we've seen that there are more than 1,000 contributors, and we've seen that there are a lot of features that we could directly use. And most important is the multi-platform support. This, this support will help us to quickly uh, port Sound Open Firmware on, for example, ARM M, ARM M cores. Now, our first uh, our first goal was to see if we can and how quick we can integrate Sound Open Firmware in Zephyr. And the first step was to look at the microkernel, and instead of Extensa uh, OS uh, environment and Extensa HAL to use what's it, what's already existing in Zephyr. And fortunately, Extensa is already supported in Zephyr, so the uh, the basic port and uh, uh, compile and getting a firmware wasn't that uh, wasn't that hard. Um, the only thing that we've seen is that some functions are have uh, do have different names, so Sound Open Firmware couldn't compile directly. So we we needed to create some wrappers. So for example, uh, for the interrupt uh, for the interrupt enable function, the uh, Sound Open Firmware code needed to call into uh, Zephyr SOC RQ enable function, and um, we've done this very quickly for the boot part, RQ timers, memory, and scheduler. Um, that's, that was the first part, which allowed us to compile the firmware and try to boot. We'll, you will see later when Juliana will tell you the problems that we uh, we encountered in this phase. So currently we are in this phase, but there are also next phases that will um, make use of the entire future set of Zephyr. So the next step is to get rid of the wrappers and uh, replace all the uh, all the wrappers with directly uh, calls into the Zephyr using native API. So this is for the microkernel part. And in the future, um, we will remove the platform driver from inside SOF and create them as standalone drivers um, inside Zephyr so that others could directly use them. And now, um, uh, Yulia will tell you more about the the work that we've done uh, and the challenges that we've met. Uh, when uh, starting to add support for uh, IDOTMX, uh, actually we started uh, from uh, Zephyr documentation. Uh, this is very detailed. Uh, the board porting guide uh, uh, was our first uh, step. Um, there are also other um, uh, platforms from Intel. Uh, there were examples for us. So after, made in, uh, made, after we've made changes in, uh, in Zephyr, um, and for this we're going to pass through this uh, uh, diagram on uh, each item. We're going to discuss what uh, changes uh, we've done to support uh, IDOTMX, but actually the DSP uh, part, the audio DSP part for, uh, from IDOTMX 8, so we, added, uh, we needed to add support for the HI-5-4 from, uh, from Cadence. Um, after uh, modifying uh, the fear, we also needed to modify some uh, uh, files in uh, in SOF. This is a module. This is brought as a module in the fear project. Uh, next, we start building, testing, uh, and fix it. <laughs> so the first part is the uh, architecture. Uh, this refers to an instruction set. Uh, Zephyr already has support for ARM, for CRISP 5, for uh, x86, uh, and also for Extensa. So having this already in Zephyr, we, we didn't um, uh, have to make any, any changes. Uh, next, it's the uh, CPU core. Uh, this refers to a particular CPU in an architecture. It uh, implements uh, early boot sequence, interrupt, uh, and uh, exception handling, uh, thread context switching, uh, thread uh, creation and termination. Some examples uh, are Cortex-M4, Cortex-M7, uh, Apollo Lake from um, Intel, or the hi 54 This was also uh, already in Zephyr, so uh, no changes uh, made here either. Next is the uh, SOC family. Um, 
for for this uh, we had to make um, uh, changes for the uh, all three uh, SOC family series and uh, and SOC because these are um, uh, strongly related. So uh, let's see. SOC family represents a wider group of SOC with similar characteristics like uh, aerotemics or uh, kinetis. SOC series represents the specific peripherals and uh, features. Uh, for the SOC family variation, like uh, idotemix RT or idotemix 7 M4. And the SOC is the actual uh, SOC that it's soldered uh, in the platform, uh, on the hardware platform uh, and uh, its configuration. There are multiple files one needs to add to support a new target. Um, for the SOC initialization, for clocks, memory, caches, we need this uh, SOC.c file, which is called during the system initialization process with uh, pre-kernel uh, level with priority zero. Uh, there are also some kconfig files and uh, linker definition files needed. Uh, this uh, default uh, configuration uh, dictate what kconfigs will be sourced and which config uh, entries will be selected and generated for the SOC presented on uh, our hardware platform. Next is the driver, uh, the driver's part. This is not mandatory, so we haven't made any changes uh, yet, but we plan on, and we'll discuss about that uh, later. Uh, now uh, we have the, uh, the board. Um, represents a particular CPU instance and uh, its peripherals uh, defined in a concrete hardware specification. Actually, uh, the board item here uh, extends the SOC uh, and enables, disables its peripherals and functions and um, instantiate external devices via device tree and uh, K configs. Uh, it also needs a DTSI, uh, which defines the peripherals and features uh, presented in the SOC. Uh, in our case, we have the CPU from uh, Tensilica. Uh, HiFi 4 is an Extensa LX6 uh, compatible and the two system RAMs with their specific addresses. Uh, this can be uh, extended, for example, if one has a driver, uh, uh, an interrupt controller driver, uh, this needs to be added also in the DTSI. Next are the samples. These are not mandatory, but in our case uh, uh, it was. We had to modify the uh, audio subsystem, the soft a sample from the audio subsystem from Zephyr. We just needed to add support for uh, NXP audio DSP. Uh, there are multiple samples in uh, in Zephyr from simple hello world to networking stack or uh, Bluetooth uh, applications. Next, it's the uh, external hall. Um, this refers to low level uh, libraries, mostly implemented by the SOC vendor to interface and configure the hardware. Uh, this can be found in, uh, in the FIR project uh, repository. There are multiple hulls from uh, NXP, from STM32, Nordic, uh, and more. Um, there's also one for uh, Extensa. Uh, here we need to add the SOC overlay for NXP Aerodynamics 8. Uh, these are files from uh, uh, Extensa, but uh, specific for our hardware. Uh, they contain uh, HAL definitions that are dependent on Extensa processor core configuration or system configuration, memory access, uh, translation mapping parameters, definitions for instruction, uh, for Extensa instructions type or uh, some um, special, special registers. In the next uh, uh, few slides, we're going to talk about the challenges and the problems we've encountered uh, and uh, how we solve them. So after adding the support uh, for uh, audio DSP from the IDOTMX 8 platform, uh, first we realized that it is not easy to debug uh, a firmware that is loaded on a DSP uh, when you don't have a trace or a logger or available debugger. Um, when we started this, we didn't have an available debugger, but one can use a trace 32 from Lotterbach. So we use global variables to set program state and uh, we read them uh, later from uh, Linux using uh, dev, uh, devmem. That's possible because we have this shared memory between the DSP and the application processor, and we were write, writing our variables here, and um, as mentioned, read them uh, later uh, using devmem. Next, uh, uh, and uh, actually the first problem was that uh, 
the code we were expected to be executed was not. That's because the entry point was set uh, incorrectly. In Zephyr, uh, the default entry point is uh, start. And if you want a specific one, you'll have to uh, select this config kernel entry uh, and add your specific uh, entry point uh, in the .text section from the linker file. Uh, for uh, IROTMX, we need this reset vector entry point uh, because it avoids initializing certain registers uh, which are already initialized by uh, processor uh, reset. Next problem was uh, the timer interrupt. Uh, this was triggered, but um, its handler was not uh, executed because it was not found at the expected address. That's because the uh, interrupt vector table entry for IROTMX8 it's less than usual, has a size uh, of 1C, uh, and uh, in other platforms, like uh, from Intel, for example, uh, it's uh, 30 uh, hex. So, um, to bypass this uh, size constraint, we added a small indirection uh, and moved the default handlers uh, at the end of uh, the vector table. And uh, in this way, the, our time on interrupt handler was found and uh, executed. To fix this, we had to make some small changes in the architecture part uh, uh, from, uh, from the diagram I've showed you before. Next, after having this uh, time and interrupt handler executed, we realized that it uh, was executed too many times. Uh, and um, why is that? Because the time and interrupt handler, if you're looking here, it's quite simple. You just get the spin lock, rearm the timer and release the spin lock. But there was a problem here in this get spin lock, um, uh, in which uh, uh, using a read and set uh, interrupt level instruction from uh, Extensa, the interrupt level, the current interrupt level, was set to the value of exception mode of program state register, which was a value of two. That means that all, in, all uh, interrupts uh, from a level above this value were uh, enabled and generated. So the timer interrupt, which is level 3, higher than the value of 2, was generated endlessly. To fix this, uh, we had to update the exception mode of uh, program state register to a higher value, and uh, this way the timer interrupt was uh, executed only when needed. This one is uh, one of the most challenging uh, uh, bug we've, uh, uh, we've worked on. Uh, next, it's, um, um, uh, next we had a firmware image that was uh, booted and loaded on the DSP, and we wanted to try some audio scenarios, but they were all failing with uh, simple and generic input-output error. Uh, first, we realized that uh, on platform initialization, the scheduler we were expected to be initialized was not. Um, here I'll have to uh, introduce you a bit on the soft scheduler. There are three types. Uh, one is uh, earlier deadline first. Uh, the tasks are executed based on their deadlines. And there are two low latency uh, scheduler. One is based on time on interrupts and the other one is based on DMA interrupts. Uh, IMX, IDOTMX8, actually uses the DMA, uh, the uh, low latency scheduler based on DMA interrupts, but SOF with Zephyr uh, uses a Zephyr low latency scheduler, which is limited only to timer interrupts. So in this case, uh, we had to switch back to the low latency scheduler from SOF uh, because we also support DMA interrupts. Next, we realized that uh, the interrupts are triggered but the handling was not executed. That's because the second level interrupt handling was not enabled, nor the interrupt request steering module. Uh, this RQ steer is actually uh, an interrupt controller. Uh, takes some input uh, interrupts for a specific channel and redirects them to an output interrupt um, specified by a set of configuration registers. So having all these enabled, we have now a uh, uh, audio scenario that are uh, working with Zephyr as they do with um, uh, Xtos. But we still have some work to do. Uh, we plan on um, extending Zephyr low latency scheduler um, also to DMA interrupts because as I've mentioned right now, it's limited to time on interrupts. And we also want to add uh, our NXP platform drivers in the um, uh, drivers um, from um, 
Zephyr. Uh, we want to uh, remove our legacy code from uh, from soft and use more of the Zephyr native uh, API. Um, other things that we want to do is to allow <coughs> vendors or uh, customers to integrate their uh, own real-time operating system. So in order for this, the, the main idea would be to create some common interface or wrappers uh, that are uh, OS generic and um, each type of real-time OS can, uh, can implement them so that uh, we can run SOF with that uh, specifically uh, that specific uh, OS. We are now targeting uh, free RTOS um, <clears throat> and of course, uh, of course, Zephyr. Uh, another big feature that we 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 aim to implement uh, by switching to Zephyr is to make use of the. Um, platform, uh, multi-platform support for Zephyr. And the first step we are looking at the Zephyr support for M4 cores so that we can move uh, sound open firmware pipelines uh, on M4. Thus, uh, this will allow us to prototype solutions that on i.mx8 boards that do not have the hi 4 DSP. Uh, another big, uh, big uh, feature that we might implement uh, by the fact that uh, we support Sphere, is that we can share some uh, ARM A cores and use a solution for uh, resource isolation and run uh, SOF and Linux kernel on, on ARM cores. Uh, what we've looked at for now is the jailhouse solution so that, uh, for example, we could run um, SOF on i.mx8 uh, mini, for example, which doesn't have a DSP. So these are only some of the the tasks that uh, we think uh, of implementing by having Zephyr. But I think this, uh, but I think that having Zephyr opens a lot of opportunities for us, including um, uh, adding sound open firmware on uh, i.mx RT. Uh, platforms which are very different from the uh, i.mx8 uh, platforms. So uh, that's all from our presentation. We would really like to hear questions from you. Um, a short summary of this presentation is that we uh, tried to remove the uh, real-time environment offered by the Extensa with the uh, much uh, more mature project, which is Zephyr and uh, thus uh, getting access to the uh, much richer fe feature set that uh, Zephyr has. We were very impressed by the community that Zephyr has and uh, the fact that it's supported on so many, many, uh, many devices. This, this opens a lot of opportunities for, for sound open former, uh, given that Zephyr doesn't really have a proper uh, audio stack. So I do think that sound open former can be the start of uh, having a proper audio stack in, uh, in Zephyr. So thank you so much for for your attention. Now we are uh, we are taking questions, and uh, perhaps we can also have a offline offline chat after this. Thank you. Thank you.